in this episode, I have the main players of the Design Mechanism Company letting you know all about their favourite books. And I look at where you can get inspiration from for your own campaigns and adventures. Welcome to the Mithras Matters Podcast, Season 1, Episode 22, Books, Campaigns and Inspiration. Hello and welcome to Mithras Matters, a podcast dedicated to the Mithras rule set and all its supplements. As always, I am your host, Inwills, and welcome to March. I think there is an old English saying that March comes in like a roaring lion and leaves like a bleating lamb. Well, the weather hasn't been too bad lately and, most importantly, my internet connection and computer are both working well. So all is well in my technical world. As you might be aware, we publish our actual play sessions on YouTube, but these are streamed live on a Saturday evening on Twitch at 1900 hours GMT, which is um, Greenwich Mean Time. There are many games streamed live on Twitch, and I must admit, after a very long break, it was seeing these games that actually got me back into the RPG arena. In fact, you could say that they were my inspiration for playing RPGs again. If you are ever at a loss, then it is worth listening to some of the other games. As well as enjoying how players cope with the situations they're in, I also like to learn about the worlds they are exploring, how players develop their characters and how the GM runs the game. There are so many different worlds and settings which players are exploring and I often see something and magpie their ideas for my own campaign. Oh, magpieing being a rather more accepting term for the word nicking or stealing. I've been watching a lot of sci-fi RPGs on Twitch at the moment and my favourite one has been one based on the Mass Effect world and it's on the channel Roll For It, the four being the digit rather than the world. And because of watching this, it has inspired me to start to develop my own sci-fi world for role-playing. After a quick discussion with my players, we have decided to alternate between our fantasy setting and our new sci-fi setting for our actual plays. So once one adventure is completed and each adventure will have a series of sessions within it, we will switch from one setting, say for example our fantasy setting, to our sci-fi setting and complete a full adventure there before switching back and returning to our fantasy setting. And which rule set will I be using for our sci-fi setting? Well, of course, the incredible M space. Now, if you're not familiar with these rules, then in episode 17 of this podcast, I had a great chat with Clarence Reed, one of the creators. So if you want to be inspired, it's definitely worth checking out. I hope I do the system justice when we are doing our actual plays and it'll be fantastic to see you <clears throat> along either in the live sessions on Twitch or catching up via YouTube. Anyway, let's get on with the first segment of the podcast, sources of inspiration for your campaigns and adventures. As a GM, I am often waiting for that brilliant idea or concept to appear in my head so that I can use it as a starting point or building block for an adventure or character. I like to dabble in writing fiction. And when I say fiction, 
these pieces of writing are so brief that they hardly register as a story. So it's something which I call a snippet story. Very hard to say, since they are but one scene or snippet and never anywhere close to an actual story. When I've been completing my online writing course classes, I often hear that writers actually use people they know for their book characters. And I wanted to talk about where the inspirations for the adventures which we have played and shared have originally come from. Hopefully, by sharing these with you, you might get some ideas for your own campaigns and characters, or even start using similar sources for your own inspiration. I've come to the conclusion that I have a very visual brain. Although I encounter people all day, well, less so during this lockdown, they never actually inspire me to create NPCs or characters. I tend to get my inspiration for these characters or NPCs from seeing cartoons or depictions of people online. As you might be aware, I use tokens in our virtual tabletop game, and often it will be a token of a person or a monster which will inspire me to create a character. This was the case with both Harmony Lee and Kristoff, both key characters in the current Mist and Shadows campaign that we are running. Just out of interest, Kristoff um, is actually spelt with a PH at the end and not the usual F. These characters are featuring in our campaign at the moment, and I actually saw their tokens and developed their characters around those tokens. So if anything, their looks came before their actual characters. I also use images to inspire plot lines as well. The story of Sewer Jack was inspired by the image of the ghoul in the core rulebook, and I added the idea that a story which might have been told to us as children could actually be real. Legends are somewhat different from myths because the former has an element of historical truth in them, and so I intertwined the ghoul the legend, the story, all together to present one of my favourite adventures ever. At the end of this adventure, I wanted to ensure that the party had a decision to make, which might not involve uh, a big battle, but might actually involve the party discussing or having an argument with each other what they think would be a suitable way forward for the distressed Sewer Jack. I think Hazra made the decision in that game. One thing I long ago accepted about myself is that I am probably the least creative person alive. When I first played RPGs, I would delight in drawing out maps on squared paper and would be the first player to volunteer to be the mapper on our dungeon crawls. That was when Dungeons and Dragons really did mean Dungeons. The corridor goes 40 foot east, and then in the next 10 foot, it turns south. Fantastic days. My gaming style has changed a lot since then, and I don't think I've had an, an adventure in dungeons for decades. When I'm thinking about a suitable location or setting for an adventure, then sometimes I just start to view the marketplace on Roll20 for suitable maps. Although these do cost me money, they are well worth the roughly $5. And once dynamic lighting has been added, the resource provides valuable fuel for my inspiration. If you remember the flooded temple in the Yubin Falls adventure, this was purely created to fit into a map set that I bought. But perhaps the most important place I get my inspiration from is from the players themselves. I am very lucky to have a group of players who are really interested in developing their characters as they progress from adventure to adventure. Within my World Anvil site, I actually have a series of plots focusing on each of the characters. Throughout the sessions, I make quick notes relating to things which have happened and whether or not there would be any consequences from this. 
I listen to how the players want to, their characters to develop and prepare to dangle carrots in front of them to lead them in a certain direction. Now, I must admit that in the recent adventure, I got this completely wrong. And when I dangled the carrot, they literally ignored it and went off in their own direction. This is when I rely on my quick thinking to keep the adventure going. You might remember that when Cyrus first joined the group, the fiery tempered sorcerer, he made fun of a bluebird messenger girl, Melanie, by calling her a pigeon and saying that the Blue Order was pathetic, encouraging to join his order, the Order of the Red. This was a hook that I really could not resist. And Melanie did leave the Blue Order and did join the Red with Cyrus. However, what Cyrus was not expecting was that her magical prowess is much stronger than Cyrus's and she's already higher up the order than himself. My question is, Cyrus, what have you created? I hope this has provided you with some ideas for your own campaigns as well as possible sources of future inspiration. Remember that all the adventures I've mentioned are available on YouTube, links in the show notes. And my campaign information adventures are available on my World Anvil site for my supporters through Patreon. One of the highlights of my last year was to be invited to Gen Con to be on the Mithras panel slash Zoom meeting when we were discussing what would be available for Mithras throughout the coming year. In this meeting, I was able to put faces to email names and recognise that there is such a great team working constantly behind the scenes, putting all the rules and updates together before they appear out on our gaming tables. In order to celebrate and introduce these people to you, I've asked them all to provide a small snippet for the podcast. As well as introducing themselves, I wanted to provide them with a bit of a challenge. So I asked them to talk about three books which had inspired them or which they would recommend to us. OK, without further ado, let's meet the Design Mechanism team. My name is Rodney Leary. I'm the author and line manager for Classic Fantasy. For me, the author that's been most influential in my life would have to be Edgar Rice Burroughs. I started reading his books when I was probably 11 years old when I discovered The Land That Time Forgot. Uh, I had just seen the movie. It was 1974. And as a kid, I just, I, I loved dinosaurs. And I remember walking into a a bookstore it was Osgood's bookstore, and I remember seeing an entire display of Edgar Rice Burroughs books, and I was immediately drawn to the cover of The Land That Time Forgot. And it was at that point that I saw that there were actually other books that took you beyond the movie. You had uh, Out of Time's Abyss and uh, The People That Time Forgot. And uh, so I, me you know, I remember grabbing those and reading them. And at that point right there, my love for adventure just developed. Um, it was probably a few years later that uh, I was collecting some comic books, and I, I heard of a comic book called John Carter, Warlord of Mars. And at the top of the comic book, it said Edgar Rice Burroughs. And at the time, I didn't even realize that those existed. And so I ended up tracking down those books. And, and before you know it, he was just my all-time favorite author. And uh, to this day, I've read his books countless times i wouldn't even be able to tell you how many times i've read them and i have a huge edgar rice burroughs collection i can't even help if i if i see a uh, you know a princess of mars with a a cover that i don't own i've got to buy it i mean it's just i just i just love it i mean when it comes to edgar rice burroughs i think he's one of the most influential authors in science fiction uh from the very beginning and so I'd say that would have to be it for me. Um, Edgar Rice Burroughs, my most influential author. Hi there. I'm Brian Pivick. I'm the managing editor at TDM. And Ian had asked us to give a top three books. I took that as 
top three books that have inspired me as a game master. So, without further ado, my first book is The Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson, which is actually a rather long series of books that are fantasy. And what I find most useful about them is his world building is fantastic. It truly inspires me to create worlds that are a lot more in-depth than the standard Tolkien-esque sort of fantasy worlds that I used to go to. His characters are very well written, and they pull you into the story. If you want to actually create NPCs or create characters that have more depth to them. The second book that I always come back to as a GM is Foucault's Pendulum by Umberto Eco. I tend to include a lot of political intrigue, backbiting, groups that are working for and against the PCs. This book has so much to give with that. Finally, the book that has really changed the way that I GM the most has been Bullet Journaling for Game Masters. That's by Dancing Light Press. And there I find that keeping concise information about whatever the game is, whatever the campaign is, tends to make everything so much smoother. In my early days, I, I tended to over note, over create, and now I can keep everything down to very simple bullet points and run a game seemingly effortlessly with so much less information down on paper. Well, those are my top three books that have really helped me out as a GM. That list has obviously changed a number of times over the years, but those are what are really inspiring me at the moment. Thank you, and thank you to Ian for having us. Next up, we have Pete Nash. Three books. This, for me, is an almost impossible question to answer. I have read so many books in my life that it would be difficult to rank the top 100, let alone the top three, for each book has its own strength and importance in the way it has developed my my concepts, even my personality. So I hate you for this question. However, when I was a boy at primary school, uh, I was blessed by having one of the sons of Henry Williamson, the author, as my teacher. And each day he would try to save an hour of lesson time so that he could read to us. I think it was one of his greatest joys. And so throughout my primary school life, I was blessed with listening to tales from Norse mythology, Greek mythology, uh, The Hobbit, even parts of Lord of the Rings. And it instilled in me a delight and love for both mythology, uh, religion, and fantasy. It expanded my imagination tremendously. So for me, there are so many influential books which are so important to the foundation of fantasy. Um, I mean, even the Old Testament is filled with fantastic stories of great miracles and, and cataclysmic dooms. And then you have the Mahabharata, a battle of the greatest heroes of Indian myth uh, with epic effects that they call down in the form of astras and such like. Then the, the joys of monkey, the, the modern reinterpretation of many, many different Confucian myths and traditional Chinese uh, religions. And of course, the Arabian Nights were a source of a great deal of uh, stories, although as children, of course, we have the sanitized safe versions. Uh, but you may as well ask me, you know, there are books which are not mythological. Um, Egyptian Magic by Wallace Budge, for example, that, that's a mind expanding book if you read it in the right age. And of course, um, books like Dune, which introduce you to the Machiavellian uh, concepts, whilst in reality retailing the adventures of 
Colonel Lawrence uh, has written in his Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Um, many authors rip other authors off. Now, two of my favourite authors I can't really include in this, those being Clark Ashton Smith and Robert E. Howard. Their main works were, of course, uh, popes during the 20s and 30s, and very few of their short stories were ever formed in compilations that uh, I had access to when I was I was young. Um, but I still love their stories. Uh, there is something beautiful about the language of Clark Ashton Smith, if you like being a, a one man walking thesaurus, and the visceral nature of the Conan stories are, are wonderful. But we have to choose three. So I'm going to choose three which have had a a major effect on my my role playing life when I first started role playing. Back then we we didn't really have many works of high fantasy. Of course there was Lord of the Rings and I still love Lord of the Rings. One of my favorite books, but it wasn't quite the role playing that we had at the time. And although we had uh, other forms of British fantasy, the, the British fantasy was somewhat different from the sword and sorcery that came to us out of the original pulps and got developed further. So my first choice is going to be either The Dying Earth or Rialto the Marvelous by Jack Barnes. Um, although these are effectively taking the concepts of the Zothik series by Clark Ashton Smith, he turns it into a wonderful sequence of stories of bickering high wizards who conspire against one another in their efforts to preserve the last miraculous powers and items and creations and spells that the earth has left in a period far, far, far in the future when the sun is so old that it has swollen to a great rotting red giant that half fills the sky. The stories are so wonderful in their, their sense of dollar and imminent ending of the world. And yet they they have this wonderful Vancean ability of uh, mischief and maliciousness of people trying to outdo one another all the time. And the, some of the ideas and concepts of especially the spells themselves are fundamental to our modern role playing because uh, they have become archetypal spells in books like the Player's Handbook for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, for example. So those tales I still love. My second book is actually the very first book I ever bought with my own money. It was A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin. And I love this book. It would be in my top books, even if I could choose every single category under the sun. There is a beauty in the simplicity of the story, the simplicity of the writing, the, the blending of a classical Bronze Age world with a Norse archipelago lifestyle. And of course, the magic. The magic in The Wizard of Earthsea and its follow-up books is based upon the knowledge of true names. Everything in the world has a true name. And if you know that name, you can manipulate it to produce magical effects. 
it is the language of dragons and nowhere have I seen dragons more fantastically represented as in the Wizard of Earthsea series. There is something about these books that I just keep returning to and every few years I'll bring it out and I'll read them again. Even though the story is simple, it's so beautiful in its own right. I really love it, but I have never been able to replicate either the atmosphere nor the magic in any game system I've ever written. I have tried again and again to think of ways of doing it, but to categorize it, to make rules mechanics to represent it, is in its own way destroying the very elegance and beauty of what it stands for. And so my hat is off to Miss Le Guin for one of her finest creations. My third book is another writer of short stories, but he released his stories in, in collections. And this book is Swords Against Death by Fritz Leiber. I love this book. It is one of the series of the Fafard and the Grey Mouse books, which uh, follow the adventures, or should I say misadventures, of two fantastic rogues, a, a large barbarian from the icy north and a small uh, thief, wizardy sidekick from uh, the urban centre of the world. And their stories are both humorous and fantastical. Unlike other famous uh, fantasy books, these two rogues are not just here to save the world. They are not here to overturn a great evil. They are not even particularly good people in their own right. They are just rogues and they're having fun. They're trying to become rich. They're trying to gain favor. They're trying to elevate their position in society. And yet they are cat's paws and tools in the hands of two wizards, very powerful wizards. Um, Shelburne of the eyeless face and the other one that I don't want to try to pronounce because I can never pronounce his name. Swords Against Death, for me, hold some of the, the best stories of the series. The Jewels in the Forest, about a ominous and haunted uh, residence uh, which strange notes and passages in books refer to and many heroes visit but few ever return from um, thieves house the archetypal story of the thieves guild which every fantasy work since has copied um, the seven black priests which is a humorous jab at the works of Lovecraft, and probably the greatest named story of all time, The Bazaar of the Bazaar. A lovely story, and again, comedic in its, uh, in its the way it's written, but still yet perfect high fantasy. So there you go. Three of my favorite books not my most favourite, but three of my favourite books, which has helped me formulate my approach to role-playing as an author and as a player. And finally, Lawrence Whitaker, a.k.a. Lars. So I'm going to talk about three authors that I feel are very underrated uh, in terms of uh, their, their acclaim, but are nevertheless some of the very, very best in science fiction and fantasy. And they've certainly had a, a huge inspiration uh, for me. Um, the first is 
Robert Holdstock. He's a British fantasy author who's sadly no longer with us, and he's most famous for the Mythago Wood series, which stretches over four or five different novels, and it tells quite a sprawling, dense, multi-layered saga about the titular Mythagos, which are effectively myths made real. Um, Holdstock examines what the nature of myth is throughout all of his his writing. He looks at how myths inform us, intersect with reality, shape our perceptions of reality, and are even made real and physical. It's very dense, multi-layered, very emotional storytelling. And the Mythago Wood sequence are, are definitely worth reading if you've never come across them before. They're of that wonderful British sense of fantasy, deeply ingrained in folklore. And what Holdstock does is bring a very 20th century sensibility towards that writing. He examines it through a lens of damaged people, uh, either through damaged relationships or the effects of war and different kinds of trauma, and how myth can either heal them or change them and transform them completely. The second sequence that uh, Holdstock is noted for is the Merlin Codex sequence, which consists of three books, Celtica, The Iron Grail, and The Broken Kings. And these three novels examine the myth of Merlin, and it's a very different Merlin to the one that we normally associate with the Arthurian cycle. This is a, a very pagan, shamanistic um, deeply troubled Merlin in in many ways and the sequence mixes different mythic cycles with Merlin as a central character underpinning them. In the first book uh, Merlin is a compatriot of Jason from Jason and the Argonauts, he of the Golden Fleece. Um, in the second book he's intertwined with the Greek myths and this Merlin is more like a primal force, the essence of magic and even though it's the essence of magic, is actually very reluctant to do it. What I find extraordinary about the uh, Merlin Codex sequence is the way in which traditional folklore from other cultures is explored. So Greek folklore, um, Suomi folklore from, uh, from Finland, um, and even some deep European folklore. Um, and it has some of the best depictions of animism that I have seen in any fantasy writing. There is one memorable sequence in the first uh, of the Merlin Codex books, Celtica, where Merlin has to dive into a frozen lake to retrieve and battle with the spirit soul of the Argo itself. It's a fantastic sequence, utterly memorable, and one of the best sequences for describing animism that I've seen in print. That's Robert Holdstock. Uh, the next writer is uh, another British writer, a science fiction author, uh, called Christopher Priest. Uh, Chris Priest is most famous for his book, The Prestige, which was filmed by Christopher Nolan. Uh, the book obviously came first, and, and it's a wonderful tale of dueling magicians in the 19th century. But a lot of Chris Priest's writing is very concerned with identity, the nature of identity, the, nation, the, the nature of the self, um, duplicity, doubles, twins, and again, the nature of reality and how we perceive and interact it. The Prestige is a fantastic book, but for me, one of his best is The Glamour. The Glamour is a story with multiple unreliable narrators. Um, the main character is a filmmaker who's been badly injured in uh, a, an explosion, which is believed to be a car bomb. And as he's piecing his life together through convalescence, um, a woman who claims to have known him quite intimately from his past turns up out of the blue and begins to help him piece his life um, back from the things that he can barely really remember. The story is spread through three separate narrators and each one changes key details of the story fundamentally. And it's a very disturbing book as the 
narrators unravel each other's remembrance of certain events, their memory of what happened, how they happened and why they happened. And the denouement is incredibly unsettling when you finally realise what has actually been going on and your role in the story as the reader. It's a fascinating book and well worth it. Um, Other novels that are worth looking at by Chris Priest, obviously um, The Prestige, uh, but also The Affirmation and the Dream Archipelago series of books that that Priest has written, which centre on a group of islands somewhere in the world, it's never quite defined where, that are malleable places in time and space. Travelling from one island to the next is literally time travel in some circumstances. In others, it is travelling to an alternate reality. Um, There are several novels that uh, deal with the Dream Archipelago, including The Affirmation, The Islanders, and uh, a couple of other uh, collections of short stories, and they all deal with various themes of identity, the shifting nature of reality, and how we perceive it. Um, He's a very erudite writer, is Christopher Priest, and he's not afraid to tackle some very big themes. Uh, One of his most recent books is called An American Story, and that tackles the aftermath of 9-11, what really happened. Um, how much of it can be trusted. But it's not done through the lens of the typical conspiracy theorist. And I think the last thing that you could ever say about Chris Priest is that he is a conspiracy theorist. But it's nonetheless a fascinating look at such a traumatic event and the effect that it had on the world and how different people have viewed it. And the final author that I'll talk about is uh, one that should be familiar to all of you. and, And that's Jack Vance. Um, What can you say about Jack Vance? Master linguist, master world builder, um, one of the most celebrated of the golden age novelists uh, for both fantasy and science fiction, and certainly one of my favourites. The Kugel Saga and uh, the Dying Earth sequence uh, should need very little or no introduction. Uh, They're fantastic works that I can read time and time again and always find something new in there. Um, Vance is uh, a master of language. Um, he's, He's often portrayed as using many big and obscure words, but really he doesn't. What he does do is use language to confound the reader and evoke a real sense of place. So he's not afraid of using certain obscure words, but he never overplays his hand. He never really overdoes it. Um, What he's a real master of is characterization and very complex multi-layered plots. Uh, The saga of of Kugel attempting to return home after he's been thwarted by Ayukaunu, the laughing magician, is just wonderful in the different escapades that he has. Uh, Kugel is the archetypal rogue. He is often the victim of confidence tricks as often as he is the, the, uh, the confidence trickster. Terrific language, fantastic ideas, brilliant sense of place, and the Dying Earth sequence, and especially Kugel's saga and Eyes of the Overworld are well worth reading. Leoness, obviously, as a fantasy trilogy, is uh, uh, one that's dear to our hearts, given that we've we've, uh, produced a licensed game based on it. Um, But the other sequence of books I want to talk about that I really like by Jack Vance is the Demon Princess saga. And these are science fiction novels, and they're actually pulp science fiction. They were written uh, during the 1950s and 1960s, I believe. Um, We'll need to be corrected on that. And they are a sprawling revenge saga set across the the galaxy. The hero, Gerson, has seen his family killed, um, and the murderers are the five demon princes, who are actually intergalactic criminals. They're not supernatural entities at all and each one has a different quirk a different modus operandi um, and it takes Gerson the length and breadth of the galaxy to track them down and exact revenge and punishment despite the fact that they are pulp stories quite quickly written quite light to read they're actually surprisingly led because what Vance is really doing is exploring the nature of vengeance and the value of extracting revenge Um, Throughout each of the books, Gerson comes to question what he is doing and why he's doing it as he sees his relationships, both personal um, and with himself, eroded as each revenge plot 
unfolds. Um, of course, Vance being Vance, there are lots of wonderfully evoked meals, some fantastically um, complex world world building going on, um, and some wonderful set pieces in there. But these are really revenge tragedies, very much in uh, in in the the traditional revengeous tragedy mould, where the the person seeking the vengeance is being eroded by the very thing that he's trying to seek. Is he really after justice, or? Is he simply trying to punish for some base lower reason? It's a fascinating sequence of books, well worth reading. So that's Jack Vance and the Demon Princes. I could go on and on. Uh, so many authors, so many books. Uh, Susanna Clarke, Michael Moorcock, Larry Niven, Ian Banks. Um, but those are the three I'm going to concentrate on today. So thank you very much for listening to my little section here. Do let me know in the comments section what are your own top three books and how they have inspired you. And remember, there is a link in the show notes where you can leave a voice message, which I will be able to share if it is suitable in later episodes of this podcast. We must all have books which have inspired us. So it would be great to recommend these to each other, a bit like a virtual book club. Remember, if you would like to contribute to the podcast, then why not just drop me an email or message and let me know what you would like to cover. I'm always looking for reviews or interviews with people. So if you are interested, you can email me on inworlds at gmail.com or send me a message on the various forums I frequent. Also, if you are interested, then remember you can watch my other content on my YouTube and Twitch channel. Here I explain the rules of Mithras, including some newly published shorter and more focused videos, post actual play videos and talk about GMing in my series The Gibbering GM. Likes, subs and comments are always gratefully received and I try to reply to all the comments you post. And that's it. Another episode of Mithras Matters completed. The year is flying by and we are already bashing through the months. And that is sort of a clue to next month's episode. With Destined, the superhero rule set for Mithras, getting closer to this release date, I will be joined by its creators once again on this podcast. And the rules gurus will be back to help support us all with those complicated rules. So until next time, have a great month of gaming and I will chat to you all in April. Until then, I hope all your opposed roles succeed and provide you with a well-deserved special. Thanks for listening, everyone. See ya. Bye. This podcast is covered by the Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license, so please give appropriate credit if you are sharing or copying any part of this podcast. Thank you.